All right. Uh, welcome to Netbox Heroes. Uh, this is a podcast that's inspired, of course, by the Netbox and the network automation communities where we feature and we learn from, you know, some of the awesome networking pros in our community. I'm uh, Chris Beavers. I'm the CEO of Netbox Labs, and I am your host today. Uh, our goal with this podcast is to learn about the people in our community, how they've developed in their careers, um, their views on some of the interesting problems that are being faced by either them or the networking teams they work with today, and obviously how Netbox and other kinds of technology fit in. Uh, today, uh, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, instead of one awesome guest, we've got two of us here today. We've got Darren Fulwell, we've got Alex Giddings, both of whom uh, work with our friends at IP Fabric, and as such, they've got a ton of interesting learnings and thoughts to share, especially on uh, network observability and network data. Um, Alex. Alex works with customers in the networks as a solutions architect at IP Fabric. He's had a, a history of helping customers think about where they're heading, how new technologies fit in, including, of course, with systems integrators and other organizations in the past. So a lot of cross-cutting visibility. Um, one thing Alex has been working on that I know we're going to chat a little bit about today is um, that he and the, the team recently released a really fascinating Netbox plugin for synchronizing uh, operational network data into Netbox and then reconciling the differences between uh, the operational state of the network and the intended state. So I'm really excited to talk about that a little bit later. And then our other guest here is Darren Fulwell. Darren has a long history in networking that spans operational roles directly in enterprise and service provider networks all the way through to customer facing roles working across all sorts of different networks and now of course helping evangelize network automation and network observability with IP Fabric. Um, both of you guys also certainly pretty engaged and well-known in, in the Netbox community. I'm really thrilled to have you both here. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I, wonderful. So what I would love to start with, guys, is um, just a little bit on the professional background side, a little about your paths, right? Maybe we start with Alex, right? Um, I guess uh, a simple question to get you started, Alex, is just tell us a little about your career path, how you got started in networking and how that's developed over time. And we can go from there. Yeah, it's quite, quite. thank you for that. It's, it's quite funny because I, I originally got into networking via hosting LAN parties at my house. I, I wanted to uh, <laughs> gain new friends and and game locally with friends. So we ended up building PF Sense routers and local caches so we could all game in the same place uh, efficiently. And then I realized I could do that as a job. It was either go to university and study something to do with sports, um, but I ended up going into the IT route and I found a university that would do uh, like a computer networks degree. Um, and that degree focused on the, the Cisco curriculum. It would take you through CCN, CCNA curriculum through to CCMP towards the end. But I was lucky enough to do quite well in the first two years and I ended up getting a placement near a, a Cisco Systems um, in, a, in a team there that essentially tested uh, customer networks before they purchased them so they would validate that it would work in the real world. So I was racking stacking equipment and we had a kind of a netbox tool, but it was homegrown uh, built. And by the end of that placement year, I was essentially developing for that platform as a PHP developer, uh, part-time at university and doing automation, um, kind of projects, Ansible, uh, bits of VNF deployments um, uh, as part of like my learnings at Cisco. So I did my dissertation on um, comparing Ansible an open source automation tool against Cisco NSO, which is Cisco Network Orchestrator, mm -hmm. and seeing the differences between the platforms and how they worked of deploying different services, enterprise DMVPN, and then how they fared against a more commercial uh, service provider offering like Layer 3 VPN uh, circuit delivery. Um, and then after that, I ended up going to work as a professional services consultant at a uh, systems integrator delivering solutions, SD-WAN projects, automation uh, projects for customers. And then during that job, um, ended up bumping into Darren and uh, ended up getting the opportunity to um, work with IP Fabric as a customer, selling it to my customers in the integrator, um, seeing what good stuff it was doing for our customers in the automation space. And then I got the opportunity to move over and I did. And it's been great. <laughs> he has to the say rest that. is history. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, Darren, maybe maybe I will ask you the same question. Um, you know, tell us a little about you know your networking path and, and yeah. how it got started and how it's developed over time. It's, it's a little bit different to Alex's, but then there's, there's probably a couple of decades um, <laughs> in it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been sort of kicking around IT for since I was a kid. Same as same as most uh, most, I guess. But but that was the 1980s for me. So um, yeah, it's a little, little bit different. Um, no, I've been I've been putting networks into businesses since networks were being put into businesses in 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 large scale. So so the whole Novell Netware generation, Windows NT as as was, and and all of those sorts of, that sort of era, right from those those 10 base two, 10 base five Ethernet uh, networks through to ATM, FDDI, Token Ring, all of those technologies till everything settled down and, and you know, we finally got the World Wide Web and everyone realized, oh, I need data centers and distributed computing and WAN and everything started getting complex. And so I've been lucky, I guess, to to have been involved from the beginning in that sense, but been able to see how it's developed and worked mm. and understanding the impact of that on on businesses so my path while it started in the engineering space very quickly moved into design i got my ccie i did i went down that that path of getting qualified and, and everything and did a ccde which was a bit of a game changer for me because that was when it really became obvious that the design aspects the architecture aspects were super important and you, you gain a different perspective when you're when you're building networks in from from the sort of ground up um, with a with a view of delivering business requirement because then what you're actually trying to do is achieve an outcome rather than do it based on the technologies that you're putting together mm-hmm. to create a solution and so that's been my focus for the last ten years let's say has been how you actually operate a network in order to deliver an outcome to the business rather than how do you how do you piece the technologies together and that naturally lends itself um ultimately into the automation space because how better to build process and and how better to to provide self service and all of these kinds of things than to use automation approaches so that's kind of i've well well alex has been very much um really i suppose alex has learned his networking through automation almost I've come about automation through um, the, the sort of traditional networking, I suppose. So come at it from different angles. But the one thing we do both agree on, I suppose, is the fact that, that the data is what, what then becomes the key point to all of that. that. That It's all about understanding how that network is functioning and how you want that network to function in order to work out where you need to take it and how you can develop that automation. That's fascinating. And, you know, one of the things that stood out to me as both of you guys shared your backgrounds is what you just highlighted there and that sort of convergence for you both on automation from, you know, different starting points, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that convergence on the realization that network data is so important, which it sounds like is a really important lesson, you know, earned um, uh, through exposure to a lot of different problems and scenarios and networks and architectures over many years and many different kinds of situations for both of you. So yeah. that's really fascinating. You know, one one other, I suppose, quick question. We landed on a really important lesson that you've learned over all that experience around network data. I know, um, you know, that our, our listeners and watchers on this podcast, they love to hear from folks with experience like both of you have um, about other lessons that you've learned along the way, um, you, you know, both with respect to how you've developed in your career, how you've become professional, you know, networkers or network automation specialists, any other any other wisdom you would impart to folks <laughs> who are maybe, you know, at the outset, right, thinking about how they want to develop as, as networkers over time? I'll, d- I'll dive in first, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. I mean... I- the, the the problem with with me is that uh, you know once once I start I'm hard to stop so uh, you you'll have to watch that but um the the thing for me Chris that always stands out is and it, and it, I kind of touched on this already is that that um learning everything you can about everything that you can is always a useful thing that breadth of understanding because you've got that that ability to 
bring information and and thoughts and processes from different areas together in order to to, to sort of reach a, a solution that makes sense to to the, the consumers of the network, let's say. Right. So understanding the, the technologies that are going to overlay over the top, super useful. But the other aspect of it for me is, is pragmatism, is, is about being able to say, um, I've got to make trade-offs somewhere because there are always trade-offs to be made. So be able mm -hmm. to appreciate and understand what the results of those trade-offs are and, and be able to, to, to make a decision. I mean, that's, that's ultimately it. Um, we certainly when I was learning um, my CCNA, CCMP and, and so on, everything was very much driven around validated designs from the vendors. You know, this is how you deploy this type of network. This is how you deploy that type of network. Until you actually walk into a, to a customer, you don't know how you're going to deploy that network because mm -hmm. they need to know, be able to operate it once, you, uh, once you've delivered it and walked away. And I think that was through consultancy work, through working with customers and understanding that process, very quickly came to that realization that you have to, you have to be much more pragmatic. And I mm. think that's, that's, don't, don't slavishly follow everybody else's rules. You've got to think for yourself and make, and look for the trade-offs. So yeah, networks live in the real world, right? right. So yeah, right. that's yeah. right. And every network's a brown field. There's no such thing as a green field, right? So, <laughs> so there's always that aspect to it as well. Absolutely. Alex, what about you? Any, any lessons you would impart? Yeah, I would make sure that the things that I learned uh, through through university as well as in in uh, employment is that make sure you've got your requirements uh, defined and a kind of touches to Darren point Darren's point is that those requirements do change over time as well so you might have a, a project or a, a goal of I want to learn this technology it might be that assist a vendor end of life that technology before you've even finished learning it so what do you go on to next and it, it's the same with customer requirements sometimes um, as you start deploying it they want to move to the cloud so as part of the design may need to change as well and i think it's just making sure you have that regular touch point to make sure that you're still on track of where you want to go and make sure you're sure that you mm -hmm. you can either achieve it achieve it or if you have to make compromise um in in some area and i think that that's uh, you, you when know I, what resonates oh go ahead alex i was going to say i think i i took that into the the netbox the plugin that I, I built is that we had a pretty early proof of concept but we after some initial testing we had to re rethink how we did it and um we'll touch on that later Mm, yeah, we certainly will. Uh, the thing, uh, the observation I was going to share to sort of bring what you both said together, you know, Darren made the point that in, in networks are practical constructs and you need to make decisions about them, you know, in implementation and operation and so on. Um, and I think what you said, Alex, is really important. The way you make those decisions is by understanding the, the actual requirements, the outcomes that you're seeking to achieve. And so connecting those outcomes with your ability to make practical decisions and make forward progress is really important. This is really valuable. So now I want to start to turn a corner with both of you to some tech talk, I guess. And, um, you know, there's this, this uh, two word phrase that, that, you know, we've, we've all said probably half a dozen times already in the first 10, 15 minutes that we've spoken, which is network data. Um, so let's start with something straightforward. And perhaps I'll ask Darren to take a first stab at this. What is network data? What is network data? Whatever you need it to be. No, no. I know. Um, <laughs> it's it's a good point. We um, we often have this conversation um, because obviously we we are in the business of network data as as are you. Um, um, so we're always talking with with customers about what what that means and, and how it's beneficial to them. I suppose traditionally, network data was was two things. It was documentation and it was monitoring data right so, you know the point metrics that you were pulling from the network to, to get an understanding of what was going on mm. um that's not enough anymore to have to have though to, to rely on that simply because of the complexity that we've got in networks now it was fine when you had a few few routers and switches and and a couple of circuits and and whatever that because you you could manage that in your head you 
you know the cognitive model you had for it was all good but the problem is we don't have networks that are that simple anymore mm. and and so when as soon as you've introduced this complexity you have to try and understand why how the, the network hangs together in order to for that data to make any sense so it comes to it and we talk about automation for me there are two aspects to network data one is about what you want the network to look like. So it's that intended state. And the other is the um, the observed state, what's actually in the network and what and why it looks the way it does. Um, and, and what you have to be able to do is be clever and be able to measure one against the other. Um, there's my first stab. Uh, Alex, have you got anything you can add to that? Uh, I think you've got, I, I agree with the two types, the intended and the actual, I think, both of them have different business context of how you're trying to apply that data, whether you're trying to make informed decisions on tickets. It's important to have the actual state data of what the network is like. And Darren touched on that, the concept of traditionally it was documentation and the, the kind of point metrics of this system says it's up or down. It's like a true or false, but applying additional context is the most important part. You can't make an informed decision without the additional context that that is that network data, um, which is where I think having a broad uh, visibility of that that data is really important. And it's really around making key informed decisions so that you can try and achieve something more efficiently, whether that's automation, troubleshooting, making sure you point th fingers at the right people, <laughs> et cetera. It, it, it's all the <laughs> way. I, you know, I, one I, of the, I, oh, go ahead, Darren. No, I was just going to say, I'd add, I'd add one more thing to, to that actually, which is, is, and I don't think either of us have mentioned it directly, but it's, but it's related. And it is, is the fact that the network is, is not just a collection of individual devices, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, it's a distributed system. So if you make a change at one end of it, you're likely to impact things right the way across to the other end. And, mm. and without that contextual data that, that Alex has talked about, really it's the relationships between the nodes within the network. It's, it's almost impossible to see what that, what that impact is going to be. Um, and so, so I think that that's probably the bit that, that both of us were kind of leaning towards, but perhaps not actually um, uh, calling out is that it's about those relationships, the topology, I suppose, but, mm. but, but broader than that, you know, how the network is functioning as a whole. It's not just the, yeah, the systems that sit on the network, but it is how they are configured and connected and engaged with each other in this, yeah, almost living distributed system. Um, it, you know, uh, kind of a meta thought I'd like to explore with you guys for a moment um, is that, uh, it, it, you know, we've all actually, I think, in in the start of this conversation, maybe used some different terms for the same thing. And this is an interesting problem in the industry as a whole right now, right? I've heard, uh, you know, actual uh, state of the network. I've heard observed state of the network. Sometimes I will say the operational state of the network. But really, I think we all mean the same thing, right? Like what's really happening in this big distributed system of the network right now and and how is it configured and we contrast that or combine that or use that alongside um, uh, this term the intended state of the network and of course that's something that you know i of course and, and others on this podcast are talking about all the time because of course. you know that documentation that representation of the intended state is what we capture in a network source of truth like netbox or, or something like it right so I think you know these two concepts. Um, we're, we're all going to have to agree on language at some point, <laughs> yes. right? The observed, operational, you know, actual yeah. state of the network, um, and that data, and the documented intended state are really important. And then what you guys have begun to discuss here is how the use cases for each of those and then the use case for them together, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And let, let's explore that just a little bit more, right? So, you know, of course, IP Fabric and, and others, um, including open source projects, you know, work on getting at that observed actual yeah. operational state of the network. Um, 
uh, and NetBox and other tools, you know, solve for documenting the intended state of the network. How do you start to to bring those together? What are those workflows like? What what do you what what do you find at the intersection of those things? And maybe maybe I'll ask Alex to take a first stab Good at job. this one. Um, it's very complicated, and and that's where you I think my my previous <laughs> comment is what are you trying to get out of it? If you're just trying to have information in in this intended uh, source of truth, I'd say. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do with that data. If it's just to show where a rack location is, maybe you don't need so much information. Um, whereas if you're trying to see what VLAN is configured on a port, maybe you need to make sure that the tool doing the discovery, the, the verification that it's configured correctly, is pushing that information to that intended source of truth, if that is what you would like. Um, I think it's very difficult because every tool uh, works differently and it's very difficult to make the decision decision of what to synchronize into these platforms uh, netbox is just one example how we've synchronized data that we have learned into that but there are other vendors that we will have the same challenges with uh, surely enough um and the challenge is is that no, no platform is the same and we have to do something different for everyone but we're trying to make a decision or a, a design decision on how we do that going forward mm. anything think, you add there yeah. yeah i was i was gonna say i mean i think that design decision then became comes based on the on the processes of the the organization that's involved right it comes back to what i was saying before about about operational approach um we have, um, for example, right. So, so obviously, IP Fabric is used uh, to to gather that that operational state that we talked about to provide that observed uh, network data. Does does the analysis and pulls together um, a structured, normalized data set that represents the state of the uh, of the network. Um, and Netbox is there as a as an uh, an in, a source of intended truth, if you like, what, how I want the network to be, so that it can drive a, an automation platform in order to, to 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 push that data through into the network and do its thing. The, the kind of form of a little virtuous loop, really, be, between the, the sort of three functions. Now we have we have customers who um, will use our data to compare with what's in the source of truth that's in Netbox. And say, well, actually, um, some of that data I just want to take from from the network and push straight into my source of truth because that mm -hmm. represents the state that the network is in, and I don't have an, any requirement to change that intended state. That's all good. Mm -hmm. But some of the data they 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 can't do that. Let's say, for example, IP Fabric discovers some new stuff in the network. What? What do you do? Do you play that straight back into the intended source of truth, or do you say, well, actually, if it's not in the intended source of truth, it shouldn't be on the network. Mm. So what do I do? I mean, in their case, what they do is they raise a ticket for someone to go investigate why that thing's in the network and then go and fix it. But it, but but other organisations might choose to do something else. They might be more radical. They might say, go turn off all the interfaces that are connected to those things, so it isolates them. Or they might say, actually, no, that's right things are flexible and do change. And mm. so I want that pushed into the source of truth. So what Alex was referring to there is is almost organizational, um, almost, yeah, whatever the organization oh, needs. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it comes down to that. But also it, it it depends on the tooling as well as to what's there because it may it may not be a something as that holds as rich a data set as, as, uh, as Netbox. It may be a... I don't know a, a, an inventory in service now, or a, a CMDB in 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 some other ITSM platform, or it, it just depends, I suppose. But which is, uh, yeah, the standard answer for any network designer, right? <laughs> well, what what's fascinating about hearing you guys talk about this um, is, I think what we're uncovering is. It's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna reduce this a little little too far, but um, nice. it's straightforward to use a tool like an IP fabric or other tools in that ecosystem to gather the data of the network and gather the operational state. It's straightforward, I'll venture, right? Um, to sure. maintain and manage a 
you know, an intended state of the network in a model in a tool like Netbox or another network source of truth. What is not straightforward, what is really hard and what really depends, to your point, on the organization and its policies and its stack and its uh, processes and so on is at the intersection of those things, yeah, right? Yeah. Because what we've learned, I think, and, and the reason what we're talking about is so important is that the operational or the observed state of the network is never aligned with the intended <laughs> yeah, state, yeah, right? Like that's it's always true. different and there is the work, right? Like yeah, that is yeah. the operational work of a networking team. Yeah, and, and, and ultimately what you want there is as much of the correction of that drift to be automated as possible, and that that isn't correctable uh, or in an automated fashion, to have at least a process by which it can be dealt with, like I say, through a ticketing platform or something like that, where you can actually generate the workload, even if the workload is a, man, a, a manual workload, at least you can generate that workflow um, in an automated fashion. But I think, and, and, I'll, and I'll let Alex fill you in a little bit more on this, I think a lot of this is a as much about being able to map those data sets to be able to do that comparison. Yeah. Mm. There's there's a measurable aspect to this and but but you have to be able to to compare apples with apples, right Alex? Yeah, you need to there's there needs to be some um common common ground between the two platforms depending on on what data is is common between them that there needs to be something that identifies that. But I think I think the problem is that there's no solution for this. Well, we have a solution for, for Netbox, for example, but people haven't tackled this before because they they haven't had both platforms running at the same time. It's very rare that that um, they've tackled the challenge of synchronizing that data. A lot of our conversations are, oh, we've got IP Fabric. Now we're using, we're going to start using a source of truth. And can we now synchronize the data? It's very rare that we'll go into a company that is already using Netbox um, and then brings us in after the fact. It, it's very uncommon. It has happened. Um, and, and we run our plugin on them, for example, and they actually scrapped their Netbox production instance because of it, um, which is quite funny. Uh, they they ended up um, rebuilding their Netbox instance based on what we discovered from IP Fabric. So there's two different mm -hmm. ways. Um, they're either using Netbox and then going now into making sure that it is correct, or they have IP Fabric and they're making, or a tool like IP Fabric, and making sure that they can then start deriving intent based on that initial data. Yeah, you know, what you guys have just highlighted is call it, um, you know, where. The ecosystem at large really is in the journey toward network automation, right? And, you know, I see this with our customers or in our community. Um, uh, there's a small number of networking teams um, who are very mature, right? Like they've, they've either gone and built stuff on their own or they've adopted two platforms like this and gone through this hard work of defining policy and, you know, figuring out how to reconcile the difference between the observed state and the intended state and made that part of how they um, evolve their networks and, and operate on a day-to-day -day basis and have started to see the benefits. And that for, for us, for you, has sort of proven the efficacy of this, call it this yeah. architecture or this idea um, and, and gotten us very excited, right? But actually, 90% plus of the world um, is early in this journey, yeah. right? Like they're beginning to recognize the importance of uh, the, even the idea of a source of truth. They're beginning to recognize the importance of, you know, kind of observing the network data, the, the state of the operational state of the network. And they're probably even quite early in, you know, tackling that problem at the intersection of this. But I, I suppose what we're illuminating in this discussion is that's what's going to come next, right? Yeah. And then and then the other point you made, I think, Darren, is um, some of how you tackle that reconciliation ends up becoming automation, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a, a great place to inject um, tools, whether open source or commercial, that, that you know, accelerate the the process or the policy um, at the intersection of intended state and observed state. This is, this is really fascinating. So we know that there's a lot of folks who are fairly early in this journey. 
and I swear we're going to talk about the plugin, Alex, that you built very soon. But, you know, maybe just in a generalized sense, first, I'd like to ask you guys what you've seen for folks who are, you know, like setting off, like how they've been successful in getting started, um, it, you know, both understanding the data of their network and then mm -hmm. starting to, um, you know, reconcile it with an intended state. What are some of those first steps? Darren, do you want to go first? Yes. Um, yeah, I guess having the, uh, you know, having the, the the data in the first place, I suppose, is what it boils down to. Um, but it's why why you want it, and I think often um, what we find is because people are using us to do that gathering of data and and um, and and have that understanding of what the network is about, being able to measure it. It's a it's about being able to create that that structured data set from this random craziness that are most you know, enterprise networks of this mix of vendors, this mix of, of uh, SDN and um, traditional networking, all of these different, these different uh, methods of, of gathering data from that, being able to bring that together and, and have a, into a form that can be measured to, to look at things like compliance you know and really mm. simple things like like you know uh, is everything the way way i expect it to be configured are these are my config standards and and this is what how consistent my mm. environment is simple things like that or what seem simple things like that build on on that whole process of how i get to a point where i have a data set where i can i can build from and i think that for, for you know that that's often where we end up having our initial conversations because people will look at a, a, a product like IP Fabric or, or or others that that uh, you know maybe op open source or not and say oh it's it's just about documenting the network and yes it is but what it's about is documenting the network in a way that can then mm -hmm. be measured against and I think this is this is where that that piece becomes really important that 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 yeah. normalizing and structured data set. I, I think in my on, Alex, instance, I find that there's like some form of eureka moment when someone who thinks mm. they didn't need it finds out what information they can get from a platform um, like ours. Uh, then the, the the mind just, oh, I can use it for this, this, and this. And, and we go, yeah, of course you can. And it's like, wow, um, okay, so I can start using it to make sure that my source of truth is is the same as what we've actually deployed on the network. Yes, it is. Can we make sure it's compliant and make sure that if NTP is configured, that it's actually reachable in the routing table and things like that? Um, mm. the, I, I find there is often a, a eureka moment when they see the, the breadth yeah. and how it can be used in other applications. It's it's almost certainly based on something that they've people have struggled with, um, yes. um, and for in a, on a particular occasion, whether that's a specific troubleshooting mm -hmm. issue or a specific bunch of reporting that they've had to do for an audit, and then they go, oh, so I can do that thing. Yeah. I didn't and, have and I ultimately, that's what it boils down to. Yeah. Well, you know, a small observation, just listening to both of you here, um, something that uh, feels like an obvious truism, but maybe we don't always realize until until it hits us in the face, is that it's awfully hard to operate um, or reason about or plan if you can't see anything, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and um, so illuminating the data of the network um, enables us to start to reason about it um, yeah. and be planful and um, apply policy uh, that maybe we couldn't in yeah. the past. And, uh, you know, that eureka moment really resonates with me as well, um, because the moment you start to observe the data of the network, um, it, it, you, you start to connect what you're seeing with something you said earlier, Alex, which is the outcomes you have in mind, right? I want my network to be consistent with the intended state, right? I want it to be up, right? I want to apply these policies and have them, you know, be be consistently enforced. Um, and you can't do that unless yeah. you can see it, right? So I think that's what we're hearing. There's another aspect as well, I think, is is transparency, because because there's this, this idea that um, 
if you've got that data available, it doesn't have to be then only the the, the network folk who who want can use that data. If the data's mm. there, all of a sudden you can make it available to whoever else needs it, and that's great for server folk, for security mm. folk, for even for end users to to be able to dip straight into that data and say, well, actually. Um, I just want to check this thing, or I just need this mm-hmm. information to I don't know uh, for to make sure my support contracts are correct or what, whatever it is. To have the data there, all of a sudden the doors open to mm-hmm. so many use cases, and and you don't know it until you stumble across it. Really, the reason that's important, right, is that the network <laughs> the network underpins the business, right. Um, and so, you know, you just touched on security use cases for network data, um, customer use cases for network data, developer or operational use cases, finance use cases is one that we see all the time. Yeah. Um, so beginning to illuminate this opens up all of these, you know, other use cases because every business, as you've seen over your career, Darren, right, every business is now connected. Um, exactly. You know, every business is networked that didn't necessarily used to be the case. I want to pivot now to talk about, Alex, the plugin that you've built, um, because it really caught my attention. Um, and, you know, I think is is a very direct uh, representation and realization of this, well, like this architecture, this set of workflows that we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, I'll just introduce this topic a little by saying, of course, Netbox has a, you know, an extensible architecture and plugins and so on. And what Alex has built and, and released recently is um, a, a plugin in Netbox for, um, I think, ingesting and reasoning about and applying policy to and, and um, you know, connecting, right, the observed state, um, in this case, you know, observed by IP Fabric and its models, right, with um, the intended state as represented in Netbox. Um, and I think you've already alluded to this. You learned a lot of lessons along the way building this plugin. So I'd love to explore what is this plugin, first of all, um, uh, and what are some of the lessons? How does it work? Tell us a little about it. Yeah, so uh, I think there were some demonstrations by colleagues and maybe even Darren in the past on on YouTube that you could probably find out there of running scripts to uh, a Python script to simply take information from uh, our platform and push it via the API into Netbox. A lot of our customers are looking to do that. They want to take information from our platform and and push it into Netbox. The, The key question is, do you want to push everything? Do you actually want to make that change? And um, more often than not, they don't. They want to see what's different. Um, and that's quite important. They want to see if there is any differences between the platforms. Maybe that's a host name change. Maybe that's an interface description that someone's gone on and CLI and, and changed. They want to see that there is a difference between the actual and intended state or, or the observed. And the, that's where we get the, the you know, the language. But um yeah, so that is mm. one common issue. They they want to be able to synchronize. So this is a challenge for many of our customers that are using IP Fabric and Netbox together. They they want that possibility to either compare and um, either push that data in and accept it or not. So our choice was to use a Netbox plugin, the plugin ecosystem, so that it's like kind of a native. It's built into Netbox and it will go and fetch information from IP Fabric uh, and do the all of that process with it, within the underlying architecture of Netbox. And during development, we tested this with, with customers. We said, hey, you're friendly. You, you, we, we interact a lot. Uh, and we said, hey, could you test this out? See how, what you find it, give some feedback. And they said, you put, you're too prescriptive. We say your host name field should be our host name to the name field in Netbox, but actually they want something else. They want to do something with the data as they import it. So, and that was the same for for many different instances. They use, um, they want to apply for some form of logic to to the ingestion process. So we've we built this this transformation map uh, concept. So that we can choose the the information from IP Fabric that you want, uh, 
and where it is going to live in that box. And during that, we can apply some logic of how we transform that data. Maybe you want to uppercase it, lowercase it, split it, um, apply any kind of programmatic uh, logic to that data as you do the import. Because it's quite important to understand that how someone may document it in an intended, uh, like a source of truth, an intended source of truth, is not actually how it looks on a device as it's deployed. There is some subtle differences with protocols and things like that, that there will be a difference. So that was mm. a kind of the tipping point of that plugin. That is, I just that last piece um, I think is really important. It sounds like the learning, um, you know, call it from the first iteration here, was, um, y y you know, there needs to be some transformation, right, mechanism for for almost like ETLing the data on its way yes. into Netbox to a, a line or de alias like the the observed model um, and the intended model. And that's sort of the secret sauce in some ways um, that you know makes it possible to bridge the gap between the intended state and the observed state and then start to reason about it too. And the other thing that, you know, just in, in looking at the plugin that really caught my eye and you highlighted this, Alex, is um, that the, the most important use case here is highlighting the differences and enabling these teams to um, reason about those or decide what they're going to do about those differences. Can you just touch on that for a moment? Yeah. So for example, um, I had an instance today where um, I was on with a customer and they were showing that we imported the data like this. They were using our default transform maps, but it's actually how we, how we, transformed it by default out of the box was not what they expected they wanted something else how would they expected so they saw that diff and instead of us just pushing a change to that box and saying that's that's all that's all you get they can say hey i can actually maybe it should be a little bit different edit some of that process within the transform map to make it how they would like to look um so, so instead of mm -hmm. just pushing it and that that's production now for them they can make that decision maybe they need to speak to a team that altered the interface description um and and they can bring that up on a query i mean it's possible that you could even get that information create a ticket from that diff so that it goes to the relevant team for that and they can start working on it and you don't merge it that change until someone said yeah thumbs up it was because of this or associated it with a change um, ID. I, I was just going to say what you've done there is is talked about is what we talked about earlier, right? Is yeah. being able to to you've created a scenario where we can automate the the remediation of certain aspects mm -hmm. of the diff because uh, because of being able to spot it in that way. Yeah. So, sorry, Chris. I just wanted to ask us because Alex, you, you mentioned um, about being able to merge. Uh, Mm -hmm. choosing to merge stuff and everything yes. there's uh, that sounds like a a kind of a git style um branching of of stuff there yeah do, do you want to uh, fill us in a bit more about that yeah so there's 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 this concept of netbox under the hood this stage changes api it's it's experimental at the moment mm -hmm. but we've We've tested it quite heavily. I mean importing hundreds of thousands of objects using it um and there's been no problem. So it says experimental, but I don't think it's very exper experimental. It's quite stable. Um, and what the stage changing API allows you to do, it's very similar to the Git process. It creates a branch on the side of your Netbox production instance. You make the changes to that branch, and then you can compare that branch against the production, and it shows you the changes of that branch against production. And then similarly, like Git, you can merge it into the main database um, if you would like to accept that change. Mm, that's fascinating. Um, well, so this plugin is, you know, I would call it like maybe the second iteration of a realization of this well, this this common architecture that we've discovered and been talking about, right? Um, to 
bridge the bridge the gap and apply policy at the intersection of intended network data or network state and observed network state. I guess there's an obvious question for, for both of you, but especially probably for Alex, which is to where next, right? Um, it sounds like this is really starting to work. It's solving important problems for companies, you know, at the, inter at the that are ready for this intersection, right? Um, any any learnings from this iteration so far that you know have you know set off a light bulb for you and said, hey, here's where we want to take this next or the next you know optimization of this? Yeah, some of the optimizations could be towards the model. Um, for example, Netbox at the uh, in its current state doesn't support BGP natively. Obviously, we collect information about protocols, but there's a plugin for BGP. So how do we interact with other other people's or the creators' plugins so that we mm. can import into their models, not just the Netbox core models? I think that'll be really important because then you can have a an ecosystem of plugins that all interact with one another so that we can, instead of Netbox supporting it in core, we can, um, for example, develop a BGP plugin or an ISIS plugin or a, a spanning tree plugin and we can synchronize that information as well um that's mm. one idea of how we could go from there the the extensibility i've got that's, other that's, ideas and but, i think alex yeah. we've talked to... Bob, <laughs> sorry i was just going to say that that one of the things one of the things we've talked about right is is being able to look at the ingestion approach that you've used for the plugin Mm -hmm. and almost separate that out right yes. so that other people can use uh, other other sources of data yes. to to be ingested in the same way and so it becomes a, a kind of central um a, a central point of ingestion right rather than than have to be uh, tied to a specific plugin because then mm. you can bring in data from other other sources open yep. source tools whatever that where where uh, be useful yeah yeah i think that's a Uh, w one last question on the plugin for you guys is um, a really obvious one. Uh, where where should people learn about this, right? Like, where can they see it in action or get exposed to this plugin? Um, uh, you know, begin to tinker and understand how this works, or where should they learn a little more, even just about the generalization of these concepts that we've been talking about, like. Um, you know this notion of observed network state, how it intersects with the intended state. Uh, any any thoughts on that? Yes. Well, the the, the obvious place, I suppose. Go on, Alex. Uh, I was just going to say we have a blog about how the the transformation process works and and the concepts behind mm -hmm. it that we released when when I pressed publish on the plugin, and we'll also be communicating mm -hmm. that out on the NetDev Slack uh, uh, at some point in the future soon. That's great. Yeah. There's there's also I think links to um, the community call where where Alex has, has demoed this as well, so so people can watch it in action. Um, yeah. And yeah, the the plan is very much um, for us to to be able to uh, to make this available to whoever wants to try it out. So so Alex alluded to it there, but but our our plan is um, to have a lab license that we can make available to members of the netbox community so they can spin up an instance of ip fabric mm. uh, and try it out basically in their labs so be, be able to to use ip fabric to discover their labs and then use uh, the plugin to 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 push the contents of that through mm. into their uh, uh, into their, their their netbox instances within the lab environment so that that's that's coming um as as alex has just mentioned we're uh, planning on announcing that in the next day or so Oh, that's exciting. Um, and, you know, just in case the reference was missed by anybody, Darren just mentioned that Alex has demoed this plugin live, uh, I think, on uh, one of the recent Netbox or a couple of the recent Netbox community calls, I think. So you can find those, uh, if you're curious, uh, those recordings on the Netbox Labs YouTube channel. Um, uh, and they are there and easy to find with Alex's name all over them, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Really exciting stuff. So, you know, guys, I think we I think we've covered a lot of ground today and I think yeah. we've touched on some really important topics that I 
you know, I know we've talked a lot about Netbox and IP fabric here, but I think we all believe um, generalized too, right? Like this workflow, this architecture, this set of use cases, we think is really important to how networks are going to continue to evolve and be operated as they become more complex. And I'm, I'm really glad that we've broached uh, this topic uh, today. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to wrap us up. Um, this has been such a fun conversation. It really worked to have uh, to have you both on here at the same time. So thank you for experimenting with me. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys for taking the time. Uh, it was a really fun conversation. Yeah, thanks for having us, Chris. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Um, cheers. Thank you, guys. And and last but not least, you know, thank you to everybody who's watching and listening to this. Um, and you know where to find us. We're on, as Darren said, on the NetDev Slack and all over the internet. Um, and we're always happy to chat with you about any of these topics. So thank you again, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.